God, we thank you for the power in the name of Jesus, the power that can set each and every one of us free, the power that can redeem and restore all things, the power that can bring resurrection and new life into us, not just in the days to come, but in the here and now. And God, we thank you that Jesus and his beautiful name has chosen each and every one of us and said, I choose you. So God, you are our heavenly parent who looks at us as your beloved children and says, this is my daughter. This is my son with whom I am well pleased. We thank you. We thank you for your love. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. We're glad you're here. Before you sit down, just take one second and greet someone around you and tell them you're glad to see them. If you have a Bible, we're going to be in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Carol Johnson has been a part of the Westover Hills Church for many years. Many years she's been a part of this church, but she didn't grow up connected to a church. She didn't grow up going to church very often. And one day she goes to church early on, and she's in a small group, a Bible class, And to get to know each other, they go around the room and they tell their story. They tell where they came from. And one after another, each person in the classroom said the same thing. They said, my name's so-and-so. I was raised in a Christian home. My name is so-and-so. I was raised in a Christian home. My name is so-and-so. I was raised in a Christian home. Carol's leaving. And as she's in the car going home, she starts to sob. And she's asked, Carol, what are you crying about? She goes, I didn't realize all these people were raised in orphanages. (laughs) Christian Homes is the name of an orphanage. And she didn't know what that meant. All she knew was it's an orphanage. The the name and the words and the things we talk about as Christians, they're unique. It's almost like its own unique language. It's Christianese. And it's hard to keep up with the way Christians always talk because we have our own little insider Words and the words are always evolving and changing, they're different, but that's that's just how all words work. Words are always changing. Tomorrow, what day is tomorrow? Monday. The word Monday, mon in French, which I can't say in French, what does it mean? Does anyone know? My. How many of you feel like Monday is my day? Like this is my day. No one, but that's what the word means. If you look at the history of it, it means my day. But what's going to happen tomorrow? You go to work, you go to school, and you go up to your boss, your teacher, and say, excuse me, I don't know if you know this, but today is Monday, which means it's my day, so I'm not going to go to any meetings because I now know the etymology of the word Monday. What's going to happen? Nothing. Let me tell you why. Because no one likes when you use the word etymology in a sentence, so they're not going to give you what you want. But two, that's not how the word Monday works anymore. It just means the first day after Sunday. Words are always changing what they mean. Recently, I heard one of my daughters talking with her friends, and they were calling each other bro. I was like, I'm pretty sure you're not related and you're not dudes. That's not how the word used to work, but words are always changing. Literally doesn't mean literally anymore. And awesome doesn't mean awesome anymore. And bro doesn't mean bro, which is fine with the English language. I'm cool with that. I'm not going to complain about it. I'm not going to die on that hill. I'm still going to ask every young person who's wearing a Nirvana shirt what their favorite song is. I can't stop doing that. I can't. I try, but I can't. Smells like teen spirit to me. I don't know. But, but words are always changing. And that's fine with how normal words work. But in here, the words of Christianity... They're not just normal words, and they can't just change their definition because these words have roots, they're deep, they they go back a long ways, and we can't just make any word mean any different thing. 
We've got to do something different. We've got to do something different with our words. The year was 1977, and the Italian art conservator, Panine Barcelona, this woman right here, received the job of a lifetime. She signed up and received this job to work on a painting that was on a wall, a mural on the wall in a monastery in Milan, Italy. It was a painting that took place, that was created in the year 1498 by Vincent van Gogh, who was the Last Supper. And what she didn't realize is that this would be a project that took the next 23 years of her life. 23 years to work on this. Let's go to the next slide. Because for the first months, all they did was just take pictures, picture after picture for months, and then they started to undo the aging process that happened to this painting some 500 years ago. The years of wear and tear, the years of people trying to update and affect it, the years of buildup. And so a good day for her and her team was restoring the size of a postage stamp on this mural. It took 23 years, and eventually you got to the end product, which is here. And a lot's changed. Matthew's hair turns from blonde to brown. Thomas gets an extra hand, which was great. And the face of Jesus looks drastically different. Because they didn't just get away with the old painting. They they spent the years, the decades, to restore it. And what we're going to do in this series, in which we're talking about the foundational words of Christianity, words like resurrection and sanctification and grace and Holy Spirit, is we're not going to just let the words change and become something different, but we're going to try to restore them to their original intent. Which in many ways, that's the heart of the tradition of this church and the churches that it's a part of. Westover Hills Church of Christ is part of what some know as the Stone Campbell Movement. Sometimes it's also referred to as the Restoration Movement. For the past 200 years, this tradition in its best moments has tried to restore the church back to what it was 2,000 years ago. Which is easier said than done. But it's a beautiful impulse, and it's that same impulse that we're going to use for the next couple months as we talk about what it means to be speaking Christian. Words that we talked about last week, which was resurrection, and the word we talk about today might be the word more than any other word that dictates how we live, how we perceive the world, and how we understand ourselves. So we need this word right. Before I get into the word, let me ask you to do something with me. Let me ask you to participate in this little uh, group project. And so what I need you to do is two things. First of all, I need you to close your eyes right now. I'm watching. Please close your eyes. And now, eyes closed, I want you to point in the direction of north. Point in the direction of north. Everyone got it? Okay, open your eyes. Look around the room. You guys look like a bunch of Pentecostals, okay? (laughs) Hands pointing every direction. All right, you can put your hands down. Lord, sorry, 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 Jerry. Laura Bardowski was a linguist, and she's done this experiment all over. Did it at Harvard, Princeton, at Stanford. Did it in Berlin, in Moscow. And the results were all the same, hands pointing every which way. Until she went... To Australia's western shores, to a group of Aboriginal people in Cape York, and he asked, she asked them to close their eyes and point north, and what happened was the entire room, even children as young as five, perfectly pointed to north. And the reason why is because the language of those Aboriginal people use not spatial directions, but cardinal directions. We use spatial language. My food is on the left side of the place. I'm parked behind you. My office is just over there behind so-and-so. That's spatial directions. But they use cardinal directions, meaning my food is on the western side of my plate, which is a weird way to talk for Americans. I I go to my dad's house in Abilene, 
And I walk in, he goes, Luke, you are staying in the Western bedroom today. I'm like, Dad, this is your son, Luke, not Christopher Columbus. <laughs> Just say it's the room with the weird basketball doorknob. That's all I need. I don't know what West and East is, but when your language doesn't tell you directions, it's easy to find yourself lost. It's easy for us to lose our direction if we don't know where North is. And the word we're talking about today is the North Star for our existence. It's the word God. And if you don't know what God is, you find yourself lost all the time. And what's difficult for us is the word God means so many different things. Because so many different things influence how we understand the word God. Any and everything becomes part of our definition. It's kind of like there was a little kerfuffle between a few comedians about 15 years ago. And you had a really popular comedian who was accused of accidentally or intentionally, depending on whose perspective you're listening to, stealing a joke from a less popular but a more respected by comedians, comedian. And so the more respected, less popular comedian had his work stolen by the very popular but often disrespected by comedians, guy. And so eventually, the really popular guy and the very respected guy had this interaction, and the very respected comedian said to the popular comedian, I don't think you were trying to do this on purpose. I just think you're a big rocket ship of success. But a rocket ship consumes a lot of oxygen, and so it sucks in all the air around it, and it doesn't always know exactly what it's consuming. And I think you did that with my joke. You just consumed whatever is around you, and it became what you used to be this success. I, I think we're kind of like that with the word God. That it's so hard to define what God is that we often use any and everything that's around. Any and everything become part of our definition of God. A couple weeks ago, I was at my gym. And I was talking to one of my friends, and he said, hey, Luke, what time are your Easter services? And I said, 9 and 11. He says, great, I'm going to come to Easter service. And you know what? I'm going to bring so-and-so. And we both look at this friend whose name isn't so-and-so, but just go with me for the story. And said, so I'm going to bring so-and-so with me. And so-and-so looks, and he goes, no, 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 I can't go to church. If I ever darken the doors of church, God's going to send a lightning bolt to strike me. Which is weird because God in the Bible never sends a lightning bolt to strike anyone. That's Zeus. That's Greek mythology. Now, has God ever sent two bears to maul some young people who made fun of a prophet's hair? Yeah, that could happen. <laughs> so don't talk about my hair, kids. But that's Greek mythology. That's Zeus. That's not the God of the Bible. But like a rocket ship, anything becomes part of our definition of God. It's not just Greek mythology, other things. Let me, let me ask you to do this other experiment. I want you to think of your father and tell me which of these four words most describe your father. Okay, here's the first word. Kind. Second word, just. Third word, wise. Fourth word is harsh. Kind, just, wise, harsh. Which one is your father? Now let me ask you another question. When you think of God, which of the four words most come to your mind? Kind, just, wise, or harsh? How many of us are talking about the exact same word when we talk about our earthly father, and God. I'm not saying it's right, I'm not saying it's wrong, but what I'm saying is most of us associate our relationship with God with how we relate to our earthly father. I'm not saying that to demean mothers, I'm not saying it's right, and I'm not saying it's how it should be, I'm saying that's how it is for many of us. It's the rocket ship that we define who God is from that. But it's not just Greek mythology, it's not just our, our father or another parent, C.S. Lewis said it this way. He said, in the beginning, God created man in God's own image. And ever since then, we've tried to return the favor. We make God just a better version of us. And Lamont said it, you know you've created God in your own image when God hates all the same people you hate. 
our definition of what God is is like a 500-year-old painting. There's so many layers to it that obfuscate, sorry, obfuscate our ability to see the original beauty of what it is. And if we don't start to remove those layers, we will never be able to speak Christian the way we're supposed to. We'll never be able to know what true north is either. So I humbly propose this text to be where we start our understanding of who God is. So if you are physically able, would you please stand for the reading of God's word from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaiming the mystery of God to you in lofty words or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. The word of the Lord. Please be seated. Hey, Luke, can you tell us where north is? Amberly and I are having a hard time concentrating because we pointed opposite directions, so we need to know for sure who was right. Brett, when do I interrupt your singing? <laughs> what is this, like a it feels like a lot, sermon? But... I've never come on stage during one of your songs. I said, hey, Brent, your yellow shoes are untied. I've never done that. Just saying, which way is north? I need to know. Brent, I'm going to use it at the end of my sermon, so just hold on, all right? What is this? What happened, people? He's gone for two weeks on a cruise, and now he's doing this? Like a good neighbor? No, you're not. Come on, man. If you're visiting, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> okay, all right, back to 1 Corinthians. Um, Paul, like some people, has problems with people at church. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so he's, uh, he, he started the church at Corinth, but there's some drama at Corinth from people who have problems with him. And so they say he's different when he's in person compared to when he's writing letters. And so he writes this first letter to the church at Corinth, And he says, when I came to you, brothers and sisters, I didn't come proclaiming the mystery of God to you in lofty words or wisdom, even though there are plenty of mysterious components to who God is. There's enough mystery that Paul could have discussed them. If you know the story of God as revealed through the Jewish people in what we call the Old Testament, mysteries abound everywhere. There's a story in Exodus chapter 3 where Moses is leading God's people but doesn't know what to call God. And so Moses has this interaction with God in in Exodus chapter 3. If I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me what is his name, what should I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. That's an extremely mysterious name. This is very similar to the name of God, which we pronounce as Yahweh, which is very similar to this, I am who I am. But the problem about the the name Yahweh in Hebrew, it's unpronounceable. There are no vowels in it. It literally is like almost the sound of breathing. Yahweh. Like, and, and maybe that's a beautiful, mysterious way to say that God is closer to you than you are to your breath, which is beautiful, but it's mysterious. Who, who is God? God is I am who I, I am. 30 chapters later, Moses says, God, let me just see you. I, I, I've got to be able to see you. And this is God's response in Exodus 33. But he said, you cannot see my face for no one shall see me and live. And the Lord continues, see, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. We'll just go back to the last slide. God says to Moses, you can't see me. You can see the the backside of me as I pass in front of you. And so when Paul says, I could proclaim mysteries, there are mysteries that are abundant. But now in Jesus Christ, the mysteries have been manifest in a person. And so the only message I have is Jesus the Christ. That's the only message there needs to be because there are mysteries all around you. But in Jesus, no longer do you wonder what the name of God is because it's right there. 
And if you wonder what God looks like, it is right here. But it's not just Jesus Christ alone. It is Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's who Jesus is. If you want to know what God is like, it is Jesus Christ and him crucified. And you can't remove Jesus from being crucified. Later in this book, chapter 15, Paul will say this about the crucifixion. He says, For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Caiaphas, then to the twelve. This is what is most important. This is central. It is Christ crucified. Jesus will say in John's gospel, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. If you want to know what God is like, you don't look to Greek mythology, you don't look to your parents, you don't look at the best version of yourself, but you look at Jesus, specifically the Jesus who hung on the cross. That is our clearest picture of what God is like. And so if you only get one thing, get this. If your image of God does not fit on a cross, your image of God isn't that good. If your image of God doesn't fit on a cross, you probably need to do some work to remove some other layers that are on top of it because it's not right. If your image of God is a deity who sits up in the heavens and waits for you to make a mistake to send a lightning bolt down to strike you, that doesn't fit on the cross, so I don't think it's that right. Two professors up at Baylor who wrote a book about 20 years ago called The The Four Gods of America. And they argue that roughly one-fourth of Americans view God like this divine clockmaker. This is deism, it's what it's called official. This is the religion of many of our founding fathers like Benjamin Franklin. That, That God created the world, that God spun it into existence and then stepped away. That God is distant and doesn't care about what's happening right now because God created, got it going, and then stepped away. And if that's your image of God, I'm sorry to tell you, I don't think it's right because it doesn't fit on a cross. I want you to think back to your childhood. Think back to a moment where you made a mistake, where you made a mess. Maybe you were, you're in the kitchen and you're climbing up and you're trying to get a glass and you reach for a glass, and you kind of slip, and so you kind of pull the shelf, and it starts to tip over. And one starts to fall, and you reach for it, and you try to grab it, but you, you, you can't. And it falls, and then the ones next to it start to fall, and then all of a sudden, you fall to the ground, and all these glasses fall around you. And there's this huge commotion, there's shards of glass all around you, and then a parent walks in the room. And they see you on the floor, your hands cut. You're crying, there's a huge mess, you've broken a lot of stuff, and if your first thought is your parent is going to come in the room and say, how dare you? What's wrong with you? And you think God is like that, I think your image of God might be wrong, because it doesn't fit on a cross. Because if you want to know what God is like, and if you want to know how you define the word God, look no further than the cross. Because on the cross, we see what God is like. Elie Wiesel is a Romanian-born Auschwitz survivor. Won the Nobel Peace Prize. uh, Wrote a book called Night, which is his biography of his experience at Auschwitz. In this book, there are Awful, painful, poignant stories, including this story. Elie Wiesel is coming back from work, working one day in Auschwitz. And he and the fellow inmates, the fellow prisoners, see three gallows set up. Three black crows, is what he called them. And he noticed that the SS, the Nazi police, were especially apprehensive that day. And they're all rounded up with machine guns pointed at them, and then someone stands up and reads the verdict as three people are brought onto the gallows. Two men and one boy. 
13 years old. They tell them to go to the gallows and they stand on chairs, ropes around their neck. The verdict is read, what's going to happen? They had uh, someone's called a, a logging camp, which would have been a prisoner who was forced to work for the Nazis against fellow prisoners, one of the sadistic ways that the Nazis worked. But in this moment, he even steps back and says, I can't help you. And so the SS walk up to the scene. The two men shout, long live liberty. And the boy is silent, bites his lip. A voice behind Elie Wiesel, fellow Jewish prisoner, says, where is merciful God? Where is he? The SS kick out the chairs. And rather quickly, the two men, because of their body weight, uh, succumb to death. But the 13-year-old boy doesn't weigh enough. So he's suspended between life and death. And all the inmates have to walk by as this boy hangs there for upwards of 30 minutes. And this is what Elie Wiesel says. Behind me, I heard the same man asking, where is God now? And I heard a voice within me answer him, where is he? Here he is. He's hanging here on this gallows. If you want to know where God is, God is on the cross. God is not the one who's angry and wanting to send lightning bolts to punish you. God is the one who's willing to experience the punishment. God is not distant and unconcerned. God is the one who's willing to bear upon him in the person of Jesus all of this. It's a German theologian named Jürgen Moltmann who in his book, The Crucified God, writes these words. When God becomes man in Jesus of Nazareth, he not only enters into the finitude of man, but in his death on the cross also enters into the situation of man's God-forsakenness. Jesus on the cross quotes the words that are attributed to David from Psalm 22 as he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Situation of man's God forsakenness. God does not become a law so that man participates in him through obedience to a law. God does not become an ideal so that man achieves community with him through constant striving. He humbles himself and takes upon himself the eternal death of the godless and the God forsaken so that all the godless and the God forsaken can experience communion with him. On the cross, there's not some business transaction that's really happening. It's not some magic trick, but it's an act of divine solitude that God is with us in the worst of humanity. That God experiences all of it. God experiences every bit of it. Brendan Manning, in his book, uh, The Ragamuffin Gospel, tells the story of a doctor named Richard Seltzer. Richard Seltzer is in a hospital room post-operation. There's a young woman who is there recovering, and in Dr. Seltzer's words, he looks at his patient sitting there, and her face is palsy, his word, clownish. He's just performed a surgery to remove a tumor from her face. And despite his religious fervor to prevent any long-term complications, he still had to cut a nerve, a nerve that connects to the facial muscles. And he looks at his patient, and he looks at his young patient's husband. They're almost oblivious to his presence in the room. And she looks up at Dr. Seltzer and says, am I always going to look like this? Is it always going to be like this? 
Dr. Seltzer says, yes, because I severed a nerve. Young woman, silent. She's processing all of this. And her young husband looks at her and says, I kind of like it. It's cute. Dr. Seltzer wonders, who exactly are these people in front of me? And then he writes these words about what happens next. All at once, I know who he is. I understand and I lower my gaze. One is not bold in an encounter with a god. Unmindful, he bends to kiss her crooked mouth. And I am so close, I can see how he twists his own lips to agominate to hers, to show her that their kiss still works. On the cross, God contorts God's self to show us that God's love is still there for you and me. And on the cross, God conforms God's self to a posture so that you know that God's love still works for you. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It is love. That's who God is. There will be a moment, there will be a time in life when you become acutely aware of just how lost you feel. It might be today, it might be right now, and it might be years from now. But as the anxiety of the present, as the shame from the past, and as the fear for the future gets the best of you, we all feel disoriented. And we all don't know where to look. But if the cross tells us anything, it says you always know where north is because it looks like a cross. And so one day, maybe it's today as you close your eyes to go to sleep, or maybe it's that final day when you take your last breath and your eyes close for the last time. May you always know, no matter if your eyes are open or if your eyes are closed, where your North Star is, because it's always in the shape of a cross. So do not be confused. God is nothing but love. Amen. God, I pray for those of us who need to remember your love. God, I pray that your spirit would enable us to go through the painstaking process of wiping away anything that prevents us from seeing an image of you that looks like love. Will you wipe away the legalism? Will you wash away any sense that you don't care or that you're distant or you're uninvolved so that we can clearly see that you are love? Would you not fill us with shame, especially those of us parents who are deeply aware of just how poorly we reflect your image? And as we know, our kids somehow find their relationship to you through us. I pray that you would give us grace for the ways that we don't live up to your kindness and your justice and your wisdom, but instead we choose the way of harshness of the enemy. God, would you show us the ways that we have colored you in a way that doesn't reflect the love of the cross? so that we can receive the love that you have for each and every one of us. Thank you for your love, which is restoring all things, including us.